I really like that idea of that spark, as you said, uh, the idea of a first love and how bright and shining that is. Want to listen to this episode ad free? Head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash ivory tower boiler room and get a free trial for the itbr professor level and you can actually watch this episode as a video episode as well while you're at it did you know that on spotify we now have a subscription service for ten dollars a month you get access to all of our ad free episodes plus any bonus episodes So make sure that you rate, review, and follow the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Make sure that you follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And follow Mary DePippi's show, True Crime and Academia, at True Crime and Academia. Thank you all for your support. And without further ado, here's today's episode. Are you a fan of LGBTQ plus books, plays, movies, TV shows? Well, then I have the magazine for you. It's called The Gay and Lesbian Review. The GNLR is a bi-monthly magazine of history, culture, and politics that publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies. Each issue brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought-provoking articles, focused on a unifying theme, and it brings together the leading minds on the topic. So I just had on Dr. Richard Schneider Jr., the founder and editor-in-chief of the GNLR, for the GNLR's 30th anniversary. Happy birthday, GNLR. Dr. Richard Schneider talked about their special volume called Outer Appearances, More Faces from the Annals of the GNLR, illustrations by Charles Heffling. They cover current LGBTQ artists such as Harvey Firestein, Melissa Etheridge, Alan Cumming, James Whiteside, Alison Bechdel, and even David Sedaris, and of course, many others like Stephen Sondheim. There's even a supplemental issue that comes with your commemorative volume. And Andrew Holleran, the writer of Dancer from the Dance, he reviews a book called Morris about E.M. Farster's Morris, written by one of our ITBR guests, David Grevin. So we can't wait for you all to experience this beautiful 30th anniversary GNLR issue. Have you heard some of my GNLR interviews, including Dr. Andrew Lear's discussion about male-male love in ancient Greek society and Ignacio Darnad opening and blasting the closet door in the queer male art world? Well, Definitely make sure you listen to them after this episode. Head to glreview.org. Make sure you subscribe to their magazine. You'll see there's a section that says subscribe at the top. Enter the promo code ITBR50. That's ITBR50 to receive 50% off, 50% off any print or digital subscription. Enjoy your reading. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I am so excited to be joined with writer, novelist, short story writer, author of 11 books, Laurie A. Egan. It is so nice to have you here in the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And we're here to chat about what you said to me offline, off the recording, which is, you know, I don't always write queer characters. And I find that compelling because the novel that I was reading to d- prepare for our discussion is called The Firefly, and it's your most recent novel. And it has this really interesting romance between two young girls, but it's also not quite a lesbian love story. So, like, I'm curious to have you jump in there. Like, what do you mean you don't always write queer characters? Because I find that compelling. Hi, Andrew. Um, thanks for having me on. And of course, yes, that's right. I, I tend to write the book that comes to me. And sometimes that includes gay characters. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, and sometimes it's love between or relationship between two women. And yet I've also done a comedy called Fabulous about a young uh, male opera singer who gets into all kinds of madcap adventures. So uh, I have sort of you know, even though I'm lesbian myself, I tend to write the books that 
I enjoy or whatever comes to me, which might be from a setting or as in case of the firefly, it was a what if plot that came to me. Mm. Well, um, since you are the writer of over 11 books and like I know you've done poetry collections, I think you said four poetry collections, volumes, mm -hmm. Uh, you've written short stories. So you've really run the gamut. Like when I have authors here, a lot of the times they're so pigeonholed into one genre, they're nervous to go into other genres, like they find their comfort zone. But what is it about all these different genres of writing that you find compelling? Well, I started out more or less in psychological suspense. I had been reading Patricia Highsmith. Um, oh, yeah. And I guess she really uh, got me cooking. And uh, her sociopaths, which she probably was herself for that matter, um, they really fascinated me. So, and I have a, a lot of interest in psychology. So uh, that was a natural area for me to go into. And so my first book is in that category. And I have uh, two coming up that are in that category. And I've got a few in between. So I would say that's my comfort zone, although I have I've written a lot of literary stories and a couple of literary novels, and I have one, one that I'm really excited about coming up in December. So um, I really do range all over the place, and I, you know, I, I'm not intimidated by the, the genre classification very much, uh, but I do find it sometimes difficult because not every publisher is going to accept the range that I write in. And that's also true of my readership, which may vary all over the place because some of them may be in the uh, LGBTQ community or they might not. I have a lot of general readers. Um, so it, it, it does complicate things a little bit because I don't really get a niche group that reads my work. Um, and also that I can always you go to the same people to have it published. So it's a question of pigeonhole holding you in a way um, that what I love, though, is you have this freedom of genre expression. And like with mass market publishers, I find when I have those discussions, I see usually the author has to pick a lane. But what I find so refreshing is the plethora of narratives you have out there. So, you know, what is like your advice for someone like yourself, someone out there who's a writer or a burgeoning writer, and they really want to not have their artistic expression quelled? How do they go about that in this current marketplace? Well, I think they should start with short stories because that really lets you have um, playtime, so to speak, and lets you explore whatever you feel like exploring. So my my uh, short story collection, which is one of my earliest publications, uh, uh, really uh, allowed me to do that and go from literary to, you know, comedy to a little bit on the edge of very strange <laughs> to young adult. And as a result, uh, I think I learned where my comfort zone was and that to listen to whatever came to me and then to plow ahead. Now, that's not going to work for everybody because, like you said, I think a lot of people are more writers are more comfortable sort of sticking within one or two genres. Like I think of um, my friend uh, Rick Reed, who writes a lot of mystery books and also a lot of romance. And he sort of goes between the two and is very comfortable in both. Um, so I know there's, there are a number of people who do that to toggle back and forth. I just have a wider range <laughs> than most well, people. I, I don't know why, but that's the way it is. <laughs> and isn't it interesting that even like the best-selling authors such as Stephen King, that he'll go under pseudonyms or um, so many have done that where you find that, out that these mass market writers are trying to go under a different name because they're going in a complete opposite direction. And they think that if people see, oh, this book is by Stephen King and it's a romance, like how, like this does not make sense to us as a reader. Um, so yeah, that whole, that have you ever gone into- Influenced no, go by the publishers too, because oh, that's the publishers true. may wanna just say, okay, um, Stephen King equates to this. 
uh, and it's funny you should mention him because I'm reading a, a second book in a trilogy right now of his, which, believe it or not, I hadn't read any Stephen King all these years. Um, but I, I think that the publishers have a lot of influence and they really, particularly the trade houses, really encourage people to go down a trough and stay there. Now, if, if let's say Stephen King is writing romance, then all of a sudden, you know, they may come up with another name and then market that romance novelist. And uh, then that works really well. And then he would stick with that. So I think that the trade houses are a little more um, careful about how they're, they're very popular authors, uh, you know, what genres they stick to, um, with, with a few exceptions. Well, and even some genres, I find when Fifty Shades of Grey came out, they really wanted the author to be anonymous in a way. Like sometimes if it's a really erotic conversation or they think it's going to really um, create a domino effect in the public conversation, like not knowing who the author is creates a publicity headline for them. Uh, so it's interesting to see all these methods. I mean, have you ever written anonymously, Laurie? And like, never. why did you do that? Oh, no. No, okay. I never have. I've always, uh, you know, used my name. And, um, but I agree, like Elena Ferrante got a huge amount of buzz for her um, series because she was, uh, you know, writing under a pseudonym and nobody knew who she was except for the publisher. And the publisher didn't say. So yeah. there was always a lot of, you know, people, the reporters wanted to know, who is she? Who is she? You know, so I agree. Sometimes that can be intriguing, uh, you know, to the press. Yeah, but no, it's a good public relations. <laughs> it's it's a whole public relations scheme. Um, but like what I am curious about is, um, you know, sitting with you and not having any preconceived notions of your craft. I love like going in as an unbiased spectator, which is, did you always see yourself as a writer? Was this something that you fell into? Like, was this something that entered after you were in a full-time career in another industry? Well, I started writing my first poem when I was seven <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I continued to write poetry pretty much until I don't write much right now because it's hard to write prose and poetry, you know, sort of at the same time. But I wrote my first novel, began it when I was 12, and then uh, short stories and poems through high school, which were published in our local, our, you know, my high school literary magazine. And then when I had to go to pick a college, ironically enough, I was accepted at Bennington and Bard College in creative writing particularly Bennington at that time was the toughest to get into. Um, but I wound up going to Carnegie Mellon University mm -hmm. and got a degree in graphic design and photography. Uh, my mother was a painter, but I cannot honestly recollect why I made that choice. I, I did always have a strong visual um, talent, but I never, I wanted to be a writer. That's what I wanted to be. <laughs> So as a result, that was the one decision in my life I, I would take back. But um, I, I my first job was at Princeton University Press. So I was a promotion designer at first and then moved into the book design department. So I stayed in the publishing arena, learned a huge amount about bookmaking, editing, design, printing, production, all of the above, typography. And uh, I continued as a freelance book designer after I left the press, worked for about 22 publishers. And I also expanded my photography business. So I worked at Lincoln Center as a freelancer, wow. uh, the Metropolitan Opera, uh, I worked with Placido Domingo, all kinds of really interesting people. But finally, I said, what am I doing? I really need to get to my writing. And when my mother died, I inherited a little money and I was getting tired of being a book designer. So I shifted over into writing full time. And that was where it started. I started with stories, but then I, I have two early novels, one of which is gonna be published in November, which I really have worked over. So finally I've come home, so to speak, to what my first passion was, which was writing. So were you always, um northeast based it sounds like or were you know yes <laughs> so where where did you grow up 
I, I'm actually in the town that I was born in, uh, and uh, which is on the northern coast of New Jersey. Okay. I'm just, I can see the ocean out my back uh, and the Manhattan skyline and the bay. And as so we're result, talking about like Atlantic Highlands slash Highlands, Sandy yeah. Hook. Right. Okay. I grew up in Atlantic Highlands mostly, but I um, I live in Highlands now. And then I went to high school here. But then other than the four years at in Pittsburgh for, at college, <laughs> um, I, I've been in New Jersey. I, I lived in Princeton for quite a few years in that area because that's where I was working. But I moved back here. I just missed the ocean. <laughs> just was like and as soon as I did that unlocked and brought me back to that writing stuff you know that inspiration that I had when I was a kid yeah I feel the same way creatively in terms of living right by the Long Island Sound in Port Jefferson and I grew up in Jersey by Philly um and but the Jersey Shore there's something about the water that opens up those creative outlets yeah. um and it kind of grounds you i need that grounding creatively um so like do you still do a lot of to find ideas like do you go into the city like what's your process to kind of collect narratives well um i used to travel a huge amount um uh, you know as a photographer as well and i still teach uh fine arts photography to private students but um over the last number of years i've had some foot problems and gotten increasingly so that travel and photography playing tennis all the things i really love to do are pretty much out so one of my challenges at the moment is to try to think of things that i can write about where I'm not creating as many new memories as I once was, you know, was, or, you know, in some of these locations that I really love to write about, like Venice, for example, or Mykonos, or Santorini, places, Ireland, places I've, I really spent some time uh, visiting. Uh, unfortunately, I'm just not able to sort of refresh that um experience so this has become all of a sudden a bit of a challenge for me so i'm um, i've I, i'm embarrassed to say but i've dug out a really old manuscript that was just awful just awful uh but i think the plot was a good one and there is a a, a lesbian relationship in the in the uh novel so i'm just going through it and seeing if i can save it <laughs> yeah yeah um, so like not to judge the Princeton environment, Laurie, but I know that in terms of like preppiness, in terms of the artistic aesthetic, um, you know, being there or even, you know, growing up in the Highlands area, did you feel that the LGBTQ community was fully celebrated? Like you were able to, you know, fully be yourself or were there aspects of you know closetedness or navigating that journey you know because we do have an intergenerational difference here so I always like That's to quite acknowledge a large one, I think <laughs> yeah. um yeah the, the, when I was growing up this was just you know being gay was just wasn't something one discussed or one did I mean it just was uh, completely taboo. And then um, when I moved to Princeton after I graduated college, uh, that was just beginning. Things were really beginning to open up at that point. In fact, I was asked to lecture at the university, and I did that through the uh, as, under the auspices of the Princeton University Counseling Center. So, uh, and I came out at that point. I wrote a, a, a an, a, an article to the editor of the New York Times in which sort of I came out. And of course, everybody at Princeton University Press read the New York Times every day. So that sort of outed me to my, you know, colleagues. Uh, so Princeton actually was was pretty good, pretty open. And disco was hitting then. So we had New Hope mm -hmm. and uh, all of those wonderful places to go. And that so that was sort of a good period. Uh, there's not much activity here now, except for Asbury Park and Ocean Grove, which is just, it's like a half an hour, 40 minutes for me. So I don't, I don't go down there anymore, really, or I'm not really involved. So I am sort of cut off from the LGBTQ 
group and most of my friends are straight. So uh, just by accident, you know, it's not intentional. Yeah, but being in New Jersey or those of us in the Northeast, I feel that there is so much integrated LGBTQ culture now, or at least that's my town has pride flags. Like I know people who live in Atlantic Highlands and like there's a lot of, you know, artistic expression, Red Bank, that whole area. I was in Asbury for the first time this summer just because I always would go to Atlantic City and even Atlantic City now has a, I mean, it's always had an LGBTQ community, but it's starting to really grow with events. Um, so I feel like we are lucky to have so many communities that you can be your authentic self. Like there is um, enough people who are out that you just feel part of the fabric. I mean, that's how I feel. I'm not sure if you feel the same way, even in your so town. Our our mayor is a lesbian, which is really oh. pretty shocking because Highlands is, is really a, a tale of two, two cities, so to speak, because you have the old fishermen and clamors and, you know, very, very Republican, um, you know, not very open-minded people. And then you have had a huge influx of uh, newcomers who are much more liberal. Um, and then there have always been a fair amount of writers and painters and uh, artistic people in the area. So it's a funny mix. Uh, this is not a really typical town, um, but I feel pretty comfortable here. I don't make a big thing of it because uh, it just doesn't seem to me any need to, and I'm not participating in any uh local groups but you know i think it's pretty friendly and i've read, read my books to community center and had 50 or 60 people show up and a lot of them have been gay themed so oh that's uh, wonderful it, you know most of the people that are there are, are straight so yeah so like do you still have communication with those at Princeton in terms of like I find you being having been in academic publishing? What an interesting coincidence since I just finished my PhD in the summer. Um, like now I'm pitching my dissertation to presses. Um, like I'm doing a book proposal. I'm going through the steps of which kind of publisher I want to go with. Um, so do you find that academic publishing? has hit a roadblock because I can see firsthand they're going through a lot of uh, navigation right now in terms of marketability. Well, that marketability in the old days was never really that important. I mean, some of our books at Princeton sold 500 copies, so that was the the print run. Wow. Um, they, they really, if the, if the book was important or needed to be published from an academic point of view, then they would accept it. And I think that was pretty true of most of the publishers that I work with um, across the country. Now it, it may may have changed a little bit, but I think some of the big guys like Princeton and Yale, uh, they still, you know, pretty much it's important to them what they publish rather than how many copies they're gonna sell. Uh, and, you know, I know there's been a shift and that's definitely shifted in the trade market, but, uh, the university press market's a little bit different. You, you know, you, depending on your, your thesis, it might be interesting to try University of Wisconsin Press. Mm, That's okay. Just a tip. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's very male homoerotic themed. So um, that's where I would. If you're looking for that, that's where I where I'd go. Okay. Thank you. I always am. You know, keeping notes. Uh, so, what I'm curious about is, do you find, um with your narratives, like let's take the Firefly, for example, with, you know, this girl who gets called the Firefly, she's very ethereal and sprightly. Um, she almost becomes just this constant image for our protagonist of the protagonist journeying to become an architect. And like now knowing about your graphic design background, I find that interesting. Uh, so do you find when you're kind of creating a romantic connection, like it's not necessarily about the sexuality of the characters, but just literally that spark, that light of flame? Like, why was it so important to get this firefly imagery out there? Hi. 
Hi, this is Andrew at the Soapbox and Why, a bath and body boutique in Port Jefferson Village on Long Island. And I'm going to announce a really fun cross promotion that I'm doing with Janine, the co-owner of the Soapbox. So I'm holding here Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West by Gregory Maguire, who I had the pleasure of interviewing on the podcast. Listen back to that episode. I'm hosting an ITBR book club. We're chatting all about Wicked. So join me on April 7th at 4 p.m. It's virtual and you can be in your pajamas and be nice and cozy. And it's $4 to join. Go to at Ivory Tower Boiler Room and click the link in our bio to RSVP. So if Janine, I said, Janine, can you find a Team Glinda and a Team Alpha Bath and Body product? She found them. So I'm definitely Team Alpha. She's Team Glinda unfortunately, or fortunately, because we want you all in the comments to say which team you're on. Hi there, I'm definitely Team Glinda, and the pink product I chose to show you is by Farmhouse Fresh, and it is their Watermelon Aid Silky Gelé Serum. It is a wrinkled out gelé serum that consists of watermelon and CBD. It's vegan, it is animal cruelty free, and it's amazing, it's hyaluronic, and it helps to soften out any little fine lines that you might have around your face. Put it on right before your moisturizer, and it's amazing. And I think it's a lot better than my rival's product. I don't know. Team Alpha Buzz product is by Finchberry. It is, of course, called Emerald with a beautiful citrus and violet scent. I have to show you the bar. Look at all of these shades of Emerald. I think the Emerald City citizens would definitely use this in their shower. And the wizard... Oh, well, he would be putting this gold everywhere. So, I love Finchberry. They're a vegan-friendly and paraben-free company. So, I don't know. Are you Team Glinda with the watermelonade? Or are you Team Alphaba with the emerald soap? So, are you Team Alphaba with Finchberry? Or are you Team Glinda with Farmhouse Fresh's watermelonade? <gasps> Did you hear that? I just heard a cyclone. And look what we have. It looks like we found the Wicked Witch of the East ruby red slippers. Mm -hmm. You can also get these beautiful snoozies slippers at the Soapbox NY before Dorothy steals them because <laughs> she's a pesky little girl. Okay, let us know which team you're on. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I'm really excited to talk to you all about one of our ITBR sponsors, Broadview Press. Broadview Press is an independent academic publisher in the humanities that produces high quality, pedagogically useful books for use in university and college classrooms. They publish mainly in English studies, writing, philosophy, and history. They are always publishing with an eye towards diversity, building a strong list of titles from women, people of color, and authors from other marginalized groups. If you haven't heard my Broadview Press interviews, you need to. Recently, I just had on Dr. Shannon Day, who talked about her book, Beyond the Binary, Thinking About Sex and Gender. And in the summer, I had on Dr. Jason Hold, who gave us all a comprehensive history of what it means to be a philosopher who studies sporting culture. And of course, we went back to ancient Greek literature, mythology, history to look at the roots of athleticism. And last year, I had on Dr. Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock, who's actually going to be coming on the podcast soon to give his thoughts on the new Fall of the House of Usher Netflix series. He talked all about pop culture for beginners. And Broadview Press is offering an exclusive discount because of our sponsorship. So head to broadviewpress.com where you're going to see such a wide range of literature. Use the code Ivory Tower, I V O R Y T O W E R, for 20% off site wide all of their books. Again, it's broadviewpress.com. Enjoy your reading. Well, I, as I said, I started out with a what if proposition, which the novel begins lakeside uh, in the Poconos in the mountains, um, which I think is a rather romantic place. I think a lot of us have fantasies about our, our youth, uh, first loves, you know, in the lakes or the ocean by the ocean. Um, what I wanted to do was, uh, you know, what, what happened to Robin, the main character, is that 
her parents are fighting. They're, they're really on the verge of divorce. And so the mother is mad that the father didn't, you know, buy her scotch because they're drinkers, of course, back then. This is 1964. And so she trundles off without unpacking her car. They came in two cars. And then the uh, father, uh, thinking that the mother is coming back, and Robin goes upstairs to uh, unpack and, and relax a little bit. She comes back down. Her father's gone. You know, all of this, you know, clothes and everything. And the mother never returns. So here she is left with both mooring parents elsewhere. She doesn't know where they are. And of course, this is way before cell phones. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was the what if proposition that set this book off. But then the Firefly idea came to me, and maybe this was a nascent thing that came from the Outlander opening scene where the women are circling around either with torches, I can't remember, or, you know, it's at night around the stones. So I don't know whether that that's what did it or not, but I really like that idea of that spark, as you said, uh, the idea of a first love and how bright and shining that is. And uh, I even... I hadn't thought of it until today when I was thinking about your questions ahead of time. Uh, even the name Robin Bennett, Robin, is like the first bird of spring. So in a sense, it is the uh, beginning of everything. And I think that that period of innocence that many of us experienced when we were 14 years old or so, and we're beginning to be really aware of our sexuality, we're falling in love for the first time, I, I think that's what I wanted to capture is that brightness and that excitement. And and at that at that time in 64, however, this was not something anybody did. So she also you know, became very aware of uh, that she was in, in territory that she shouldn't be in, in her mind. Yeah. Well, do you find that there's a lot of examples where there are a lot of examples you turn to to explain that early feeling of love like you know is there a source material you turn to anything in our culture or this really was just coming from your own primal instinctual knowledge of like the butterfly feeling of a spark of love yeah i think it was mostly my own i mean i don't read uh contemporary lesbian romance and this isn't totally a romance book. This is also mm -hmm. really a coming of age portrait of Robin. Uh, and so the Firefly, wh whose name is Stella, is a really driving force all the way through the novel, but she disappears suddenly. So um, I think that the this is really more of a coming of age thing. As far as my own personal readings, I tend to read the classics more than anything. Um, and that's also true. I really love some of the films like from 1990, Portrait of a Marriage with mm -hmm. um, Janet McTeer was just wonderful production. And the novel, I mean, the the uh, the book by uh, Vita Sackville West's son, uh, oh. Nigel Nicholson, is is really a wonderful read, too. So they were they were important books because uh, that um, Portrait of a Marriage is really about the relationship with Vita Sackville West and Violet Keppel, or Violet Keppel Trefusis. And so that book actually inspired uh, Wave in D Minor, which is about a young opera uh, composer. Uh, and I actually got to write some lyrics about the relationship between Vita and, and Violet and Vita and Virginia Woolf. So I had a great time with that. But I would say I tend to be more classical reading uh, Orlando I have my December book uh it's got magical realism it's literary it's called the black leopard's kiss and the writer remembers and it is uh you know two link novellas but it's got very Orlando-esque features so Virginia Woolf has always been you know one of my main inspirations for reading um so I I if I just did not into a lot of the, the current lesbian romance, so I can't even name anybody much. Uh, one I really liked that I did read a number of years ago was uh, Sylvia Brownrigg's, um, what is it? Um, Pages for You. I mean, sorry. Mm. Um, yeah, Pages for You. And I thought that was a really beautiful love story. 
But other than that, um, you know, I except for, you know, when I have to review books, uh, I don't tend to read in that category very much. Films, yes, but not not so much books. Well, I think you're setting, you're teeing us up for an author who's going to come on the show. Her name is Amelia Pasanza. And this summer she wrote a book called Lesbian Love Story. And it's all about... Um, her journey into the archives and uncovering lesbian romances throughout history. So thank you for that, Laurie. Um, you know, you've kind of, your interview's coming out before her. Coincidence? No. Uh, so <laughs> there's a method to my scheme. But like, I was getting Virginia Woolf vibes from you. Not like just, you know, not appearance wise, but just in the aesthetic, I find that you're you seem to be such a comforting presence of like knowledge. And I can like sense that classic classicist sense from you. And I find that even when you inherited some money, it reminded me instantly of a room of one's own, which I still find to be, you know, yeah. even though Virginia Woolf, um, you know, does she I would say she doesn't um proclaim to say she speaks for all women which I don't think anyone can speak for all people, like all of your group, um, right? Like not even a gay writer can speak for the whole community. I think that's an onerous task to put on them. That even in her book, she explains that freedom you get, like financially, especially as a woman, with being a creator and an artist. Um, so like, is there something about Virginia Woolf? Do you remember when you first read Mrs. Dalloway? You mentioned Orlando. Like, what is it about her prose that fascinates you? Well, I've always loved the immediacy that she creates and and perhaps uh, a little bit of solitariness, which I always love in characters. Uh, Damon Gallagut is another favorite author of mine, a male South African writer. And he writes a lot of solitary characters. and. Um, I think one of the things that Wolf really did in, in the modern sense, I mean, I think she's widely considered one of the modern writers uh, and mm -hmm. broke a lot of uh, barriers. Uh, um, I, I love that sort of Mrs. Dalloway, very simple opening, very slow, actually. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I mentioned in this new, the two novellas that I'm going to be publishing in December is that that can be a difficult in modern right now because everybody wants to hit the ground running they want a first sentence that just knocks your socks off and just is a great hook so wolf wasn't one of those writers that did that very much mm -hmm. so it's very there's sort of a leisureliness to her to her work but i find that very appealing but it, it i have to be very careful if i try to do that because sometimes that you know, is is difficult for contemporary readers. And there's such a coziness, I feel, with Mrs. Dalloway. Like, Mrs. Dalloway would buy the flowers herself. That line mm. has always stood out to me as representative of her stream of consciousness method, but it's also how psychological we're going to get this character and her complexity. Mm. And I agree with you. There's, I find Mrs. Dalloway to be one of the best novels written, in my opinion. And, you know, if I have to put it up against Ulysses, I will always choose Mrs. Dalloway. And that's not to like put down Ulysses, but it's just Ulysses. I feel James Joyce really wants to confuse the reader with his um, puzzle like stream of consciousness where Virginia Woolf, I don't think, was trying to pull the wool over your eyes to show her mastery. I think it's just like you said, she's showing the solitude of someone's thoughts and it's a really refreshing novel in that way. And there's queerness, there's um, her personal um, everyday life shown through that novel, through those characters. Yeah, if everyone out there listening hasn't read Mrs. Dalloway, I think if you need a classic, yeah, classic novel, um, I would choose that. But, or George Eliot, right? Middlemarch, you're making me think of Middlemarch, which I find fascinating too. Um, there's something about Victorian novels. Like, that's why I studied the 19th century. They're just, it's a task that you get through. Yeah, you have to yeah, work I, hard. I, I really, uh, I, I love 
you know, that period, if, if I had to be, a, if I could be reborn, I would love to have been in, in Bloomsbury. You know, even if I didn't have to, if I didn't even say a word, just sitting on, you know, in a corner somewhere. I, I mean, that, that was just such an amazing, uh, astonishingly rich uh, period with so many different people that were uh, doing all kinds of unusual things in the arts. And, you know, what conversations they must have had. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, and that <laughs> I, coterie of, yeah. it's like when you mentioned New Hope, I mean... I remember my first memories when I was a child. Every summer, I'd go to New Hope. Um, I'm going to be back in New Hope soon. My uh, aunt lives near there. Um, and like those types of communities where you're able to just um, come together to experiment with fantasies and ideas and the playhouse is there, the bookstore, like there's something so idyllic in the writer's retreat sense. And I remember how artistically eccentric New Hope was when I was a child with, you know, risque paintings and all different kinds of stores. It's changed more into the tourism, which every town has now. But, you know, they have to, small businesses need to find their niche audience and they need to market. Um, but do you feel like, talking about Virginia Woolf and the Bloomsbury group, it's what I love about your writing is you're bringing us back to this time of 1964 is when the firefly, the beginning takes place, but you're bringing us back to a period without so many technological distractions. And I really feel like we are in a new age. Like we're not just in the techno technological age, we're in like the age of social media. And like, I know how much I, I have to use social media, but I always advocate that we should all be taking mental health, like walk breaks or just like being very aware, take a bubble bath, like do something that takes you away from the technology because it's in our face every day. Like, how do you well, feel dealing with this? I, I, I agree with you. And I think one of the hardest things for a writer to deal with is the advent of the cell phone just mm -hmm. right there. Because what happened is, is that uh, once it became widely used, uh, there was no way to get away from being communicative with everybody. Uh, everybody knew where you were, what you were doing, what you were mm -hmm. thinking. And as a result, particularly for writing mysteries, this was, this I, I admire people that can handle this, but I just can't. And uh, I that's why I tend to set you know, my books back a ways before a lot of cell phones or even all that much, like, you know, the, the internet even. I mean, that, that allowed anybody to look anything up uh, so that there are a lot of impediments that I find for uh, including uh, all this media stuff uh, as a writer. So I just had to try to avoid it. Plus, I'm just not into it. I, one of my recent short stories was called Christmas Interruptus about um, sitting down at a table and everybody's got their cell phones out and the the person, the protagonist, the narrator doesn't. And it's just like, she feels absolutely lost and out of place. And you can't get a conversation going with anybody because then the cell phone will go off or somebody says, oh, well, let me look, let me show you a picture of my grandchild. Or, so it was this, it was a satire, but it's really true. Um, I, I find I, I don't like cell phones very much, so I don't use them very, very often, but I'm, I'm weird. <laughs> well, do you consider yourself, what's that word? Is it a Luddite? Yeah, sort of. Right. <laughs> No, I had some Luddites on this podcast, which is always, you know, exciting experience um, to, you know, pull that Band-Aid quickly off of this, what we call media world. But I think we can, like my whole point here is we can bring all this together, right? Like being intentional, especially for my generation, the millennials or the Gen Zers, like those of us who've grown up with technology everywhere, that I think now we're being more... Um, Oh, socially aware, like even just taking breaks is so important. Um, but, you know, one of my final points, like this has flown by, um, but how do you feel, like I know you, you're not necessarily reading contemporary lesbian literature, but do you feel like even what you've seen 
in the TV sphere, the film sphere. I mean, I remember when I saw, you mentioned Patricia Highsmith. I thought Carol, the movie was done really well. Um, yeah. And do you think that there's a much larger range now of nuanced queer characters, especially female ones, um, than say an Orlando? who's androgynous or is fluid. Like, do you feel that those characters have transcended over the years or we still do rely on certain stereotypes? Absolutely. So you all know that I am such a fan of musical theater and classic movies. So I can't wait for you all to listen to one of my good friend's podcasts. It's called That Old Gay Classic Cinema hosted by Christian Garcia. It's a podcast that looks at classic cinema films that we know and love. And he was inspired by Turner Classic Movies and The Great Movie Ride. Remember that amazing ride where the Wicked Witch of the West rose up in a burst of flame in Disney? That was one of my favorite rides. I'm so sad it closed. So while looking at classic films, Christian is so excited to look at it with a queer lens. And he brings on friends like myself to talk about all of these films. I was on the first episode when we discussed The Sound of Music. I've been on an episode of Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. He just released an episode about the Philadelphia story. He's done Meet Me in St. Louis, Sweet Charity, Psycho, Mary Poppins, Hello, Dolly. He had on Down the Yellow Brick Road hosts and the Garland Gab hosts to talk about The Wizard of Oz. So make sure that you listen to That Old Gay Classic Cinema on Apple and Spotify and follow him on TikTok and Instagram at That Old Gay Classic Cinema. Okay, start watching the classic movies and make sure you listen to Christian's podcast. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby. And when I'm not here on the podcast, I am consulting with small businesses, undergraduate students, graduate students, podcasters, and those in media. So if you're curious about the work that I've done with my consultation services, you could just type me in on Google, Ivory Tower Boiler Room, and you'll see a few reviews pop up. I've worked on college admission essays for undergraduate students. I've revamped and expanded a small business's social media marketing campaign right here in Port Jefferson, New York. And I've also worked on a graduate student's thesis for her physician assistant program. So if you want to seek me out or inquire about my consultation services, just email me. That's the easiest way to reach me at ivorytowerboilerroom at gmail.com. That's easy to remember. And tis the season for college admission essays, both undergraduate and graduate, thesis writing, dissertation writing. Um, do you want to create a podcast and you don't know where to begin? Media work, um, how to open a TikTok, how to start creating videos on TikTok, what to do with your Instagram. All of that I have done. So just reach out to me. I mean, I, I've been watching uh, BBC's uh, Silent Witness, which started, um, I don't know how many years ago. But I think there are 28 seasons of the damn thing, uh, mostly set in, in the London area. And I've been watching it how many times, like every fourth or fifth or sixth episode, there's got to be some gay characters in it. Now, that would not have been true you know, days of yesteryear. And that's, I think, also very true now. You know, the films, I think, are really in the uh, advanced stages here uh, it, representing the community and well. Um, you know, you mentioned Carol. I mean, that was very nicely done. But, you know, you got to remember when Highsmith wrote that, it was called Price of Salt, and mm -hmm. she used a pseudonym because she was afraid of the reaction that people would have if that well-known author, Patricia Highsmith, was outed even though she was mm. very out in her life. So I think, yeah, I think films are really exciting uh, to see. I didn't see Gentleman Jack, 
but I, I may have to buy it on DVD because, uh, you know, Netflix is, ne they never sent it out, unfortunately. So that's what I would really like to see. But I think that there are quite a few really good films. Yeah, well, and The Gilded Age season two is back. Yes, I love yes, the first love season and they incorporate queerness in an interesting way. Downton Abbey did as well. Oh, yeah. um, oh I miss. See, there these are the series I love because I feel like those period dramas we don't give everything to you right away. And that's why it's hard for me to find a current TV show really gripping because I think they um, give you the exposition up front too fast. It's like we've reached the climax too quickly. Like we need some anticipation. And, um, you know, there's some shows that do hit that stride, but I think they're so nervous that the modern day audience is going to complain that it's building too slowly. But, you know, as I'm recording this, I'm about to see that new um, film, um, Killers of the Flower Moon, um, you know, with Leonardo DiCaprio, directed by Martin Scorsese. And yeah, I know it's, it's three like and a half hours. hours. Yeah. yeah. But I kind of look forward to it because I know it's going to be an experience. And, you know, um, our everyday audience, though, like a lot of people hearing how long it is, they've tuned out. Like they're already disinterested because well, it's yeah, a commitment. Sure. Attention spans. That's one of the other problems with computers. And I am guilty uh, of that problem, dealing with that problem too. Um, that's interesting that you mentioned that film because my, my mother's from Oklahoma and my grandfather bought up land uh, during this period uh, I think he understood that there was oil underneath and unfortunately he died when my mother was five. Um, so my grandmother had to deal with it, but I'm really curious to see that film because um, my mother never mentioned any of the Indian issues growing up, even though, she, you know, she was born in 1914. So, you know, she was right after the Oklahoma land run. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's going to be, you know, really an interesting um movie to see a film to see yeah. yes well i can't you know i need to hear your thoughts when you see it you'll have to write to me um okay. and you know if you do see it maybe i'll have to have you back on as like a special little episode and i'll bring <laughs> on my friend who wa like watched it with me and we'll just recap our experience but um do you think that there is a way to um consume like you were talking about Silent Witness, but I'm even thinking of in December or when this comes out, it probably will have just premiered, which is the color purple. I can't wait for the new musical adaptation to hit our screens again. And it's, you know, coming out during the holidays. It's coming out in a major production um, way from Hollywood. And I think a lot of it is just that exposure. Like you need a studio to back you, you need these stories to be told and it costs a lot of money. Um, you know, do you feel that there's actually some freedom in what you do in terms of being a writer that you're able to get out your narratives? Like you're, do you think you're able to tell more nuanced narratives because you don't have all those gatekeepers and roadblocks? Yeah, probably because, um, you know, nobody's i'm certainly not making any money i mean you know uh it, it smaller you know publishers are just not paying good royalties although my new uh publisher uh, andrew may at spectrum books in london has just been absolutely wonderful he took four of my books cleared off my desk um <laughs> which is you know both a good thing and a bad thing because now I've got to figure out something else to write but I think um without having to have the necessity of making money to support myself that does help me tremendously in terms of I can do what I want the trick is finding somebody to publish it although you know um that that I've been very fortunate so far to find publishers who are willing to to do that but I am unusual in the sense that I don't have to make a living at this. And, you know, um, this could not have been true many years ago for me, but now it is. And I do have a lot more leeway in terms of what I write, who I write for, uh, and what I do with my books. So, um, yeah, 
Although, I, of course, I would love to have a film made. <laughs> well, let's option that for you, Lori. Like, okay. let's manifest and send that out for everyone listening. Um, you know, I can already like envision the scene of just the two girls meeting and mm -hmm. um, almost... I could even envision it in Louisiana with like the moss trees and, you know, the stars twinkling. It's very, it's very visual the way you write. And I find well, that I'm a photographer cinematic. too. So well, that, it you know, comes in I, handy. my background is also very strong visual art. So uh, I think that that really has played a really, uh, a large role in, in my seeing well. And um you know, like, for example, the first book I had published, Jenny Kidd, is set in Venice. And I think it did a really good portrait of that city and not the usual one, uh, mm -hmm. because I had also taught a location workshop there. So I had been there like three times and I really I had a really strong visual sense of the city. And uh, so whenever I can do that, that works out really well. And I, I was basing the Firefly on a Pocono Lake that I had visited. So I changed the name, but it's uh, Split Rock Lodge in the Poconos, which was a place where my, par my parents took me to when I was smaller. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so the visuals are important, absolutely. Yeah. So my last question for you is, um, are you more of a, like you've talked about visuals and you have your photography sense about you. Like, are you also, does auditory aspects really help you when you're creating narratives? Like, are you also um, attuned to people's dialects, to their conversations? Like, are you, um, that person jotting down in your memory bank, hearing conversations in the local coffee shop or the library? Like, is that another aspect where you're pruning for information for your narratives? Sometimes, not as much auditory. I, I'm, I'm more visual. And I remember um, going to an agent's workshop at one point and they were all saying that uh, if you can include a sense of smell, some kind of smell right up at the beginning, that that would hook them right away. And I thought that's really interesting because we don't think about smell as much as we do about what we hear and what we see. Mm -hmm. So uh, I try to be sensitive to, to that a little bit, um, but I think visual is probably more my dominant sense. Although, you know, when I was just starting, I'd go to the Metropolitan Opera. I had a first row center seat, believe it or not, subscription. And I often had dinner by myself. So I would look at people that were in the restaurant ahead of time and I would make up stories about them. And sometimes I could hear a little bit of their conversation. So I would weave that in. So I think it was just like practice. Uh, and it was a lot of fun for me. So I, I, I love writing dialogue. I find it hard because I'm sort of reserved, but uh, I have to often expand my dialogue and open it up. It's, um, I tend to compress too much. So that's one of my own personal goals when I'm, when I'm writing. But yeah, I, I, I enjoy all of that. Visual, auditory, and smell. Yeah, I know I said that would be my last question, but I have one little follow up, which is just for everyone listening. There's so many who are working full time jobs, I'm sure, but they have their artistic passion and they wish that their artistic passion. I mean, I can relate to this that, you know, I'm now an entrepreneur. This is my small business and I'm consulting like I've added like different services and like expanded my brand. And there's risks, right? Like there's risks of dollar signs, not knowing where all the avenues are going to pay off, but like just trusting in myself. But like you, you know, I do have um, security behind me in terms of at least having a little cushion to like get me started. Um, what's your advice though, for someone who's in a full-time job and they really want to expand their artistic passion, but they have this, you know, burden even though i'm sure they hopefully enjoy their job but it is seen as an obstacle for them what would you say to that person well i think uh, you know one of the things is 
patience and diligence. You know, those are two really important things, particularly diligence. So if they could set aside uh, like weekends or um, either if there are night owls at night or early morning before they go to work, set aside, you know, an hour, hour and a half, two hours, anything that is regular and start with small things, either, you know, short stories or, uh, you know, one of the things I never know when I'm starting out, whether this is going to be a short story, something longer or a novel. So you have to just say, you know, sometimes you know where the end, the goalposts are going to be, and you know, it's going to be a short story. Fine. But the main thing is diligence sitting down at the computer and writing. So you've heard me gush about my friend Mandy Bengal's business called Mandy Made It. It is a cricket and crochet company. And as she says, especially for the kids at heart, which I think actually comes from Wizard of Oz. So I know that Mandy has made such beautiful items for Mary to Pippi, for myself. I have a Hocus Pocus bed and breakfast sign that says Sanderson bed and breakfast in my living room. She's also made the poison apple from Snow White for me as a crocheted item. Recently, I gifted my boyfriend a crocheted ghost face bouquet that is just so gothically, hauntingly beautiful. She, I'm sure, can make you bunny rabbits, flowers, anything that you want for the spring season. She's making Pokemon items right now. So make sure you follow her at Mandy Made It, M A N D E E Made It. And you'll see an example of all of the different items that she's been crafting right now. And because our Wicked Book Club is on April 7th at 4 p.m., I definitely know that she could make an Alphaba and Glinda item for you. So I'm going to actually reach out to her because I'd love to have my hands on an Alphaba or Wicked Wizard of Oz Wicked collab item from Mandy Made It. And make sure you mention ITBR because she will gift you with a small free gift with your first order from Mandy Made It. Enjoy your crafts. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? Or have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? Then the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie. In addition to the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog. So you can see all of this on glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W.org. Remember, you get 50% off your subscription of the GL Review magazine when you use the promo code ITBR50. That's 50% off your print or digital subscription when you use promo code ITBR50. To learn more about submitting an article for the GNLR, Visit their writer's guidelines. The link is located at the bottom of their homepage. And if you have any questions, email Stephen Hemrick. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot H-E-M-R-I-C-K at glreview.org. The GNLR and its readers can't wait to see what you have to say. And when you're not, if you are at work or, you know, uh, at a restaurant, keep keep a little notebook or some way of, you know, recording anything that comes into your mind. Some of the most fertile times in my mind are when I wake up in the middle of the night or if I can't go to sleep, I yeah. always have something nearby so I can write it down because those are when wonderful yeah. ideas come. There you go. He's got it. I have a Phantom of the Opera notebook, but I have notebooks okay. everywhere, Lori. I agree. It's such a great yeah. You just have model. to do it. Just as as the old slogan was, just do it. Um, that's the main thing because, and, and don't put it off because the longer you put it off, the tougher it gets. And, you know, I think that there is still some strong youth-based interest by agents and publishers. So, uh, starting late, like I did, it was really a problem. As I said, if I'd gone to Bennington back when I was, 
you know, applying to colleges, I would have been a published author in my 20s because I would have had an immediate pipeline into um, publishing agents, et cetera. The other thing too is, you know, if you can uh, take night courses or online courses, mm -hmm. you know, work it with a, a really good uh, writer's group if you can find yes. one. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, you so you've got a schedule uh, in yeah. a way. That Your public help. library, my like mom is retired now, but she tells me about all these book clubs and like artists she meets. And I thought, well, that's right. Go to your public library and you find that's those right. like mind minded people, right? Go to your coffee shop after work. I don't know. For me, Lori, like my hardest obstacles when it comes to writing or any artistic project, right? To not get that wall built. I mean, talk about a huge obstacle was my dissertation, but like the writer's block intensifies when you don't have that habitual pattern and like I love what you're saying is to have like that notebook as a buffer for ideas but also I would say like going for it doesn't just have to be a walk but like having that space of in between time like of you know after your full-time job just De like disconnecting from it so then you can go into the art right it's like you have to have a um a bridge between them because i think then you're just burn out and we can't produce art when we're burn out um no. you know one thing i i sometimes do to get myself going is what's a great first line mm. i just pick something up at it let your let your subconscious go go and then Write that down and then follow it. Um, that can be a lot of fun. And that could be a, a short story or something longer. Um, yeah. One of the books that I wrote, uh, the first line was, death is in the house. Oh. Well, I mean, wow, bang. You, you know, the reader's going to hit that and say, well, what's going to happen? You know, yeah. so. Was um, there a murder that took place? So, uh, yeah. You know, is the author <laughs> feeling as if they're uh, a corpse yeah. inside? I mean, well, there's a lot. That's in a prologue. Um, it's Wave in D minor, which is sort of a literary suspense. Uh, it's about that young opera composer um, who's working on a, a, an opera about the relationship between Virginia Woolf and Vita Sackville West and Violet and Vita. So, uh, but she's up in the main in the winter. She, her patron has given her his house. So it's it's a cozy in that regard, cozy mystery. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and even with social media, I have to say, like, what has helped me is being accountable on social media. Like, there is a way to use it um, to, like, put that line out there to the public and say, like, what do you think? Where do you think my narrative is going to go? Right. Like, there is fun ways to hold yourself accountable using technology. Um Right. The hardest part is just once you put it out there, not to start to scroll through everything and then all your time is sucked up. So, <laughs> you know, boundaries are good. Um, Laurie, this has been wonderful. I've loved chatting with you. So Laurie A. Egan, author of 11 books, a new book, right, in December. When this comes out, your new book has come out. So what is it called again? Well, I have two. Um, two. The one in November, okay. uh, The Psychologist Shadow about uh -huh. a therapist who suddenly acquires a stalker oh. and she doesn't know who it is. So we're sitting in on sessions to sort of guess. And the other one is a literary work with magical realism. Uh, and that's called the black leopards kiss and the writer remembers. Mm. So that, that has um, some LGBTQ interest there. The, the psychologist shadow uh, there, there are a couple of gay characters, but they're minor. So that's wow. more of a, but it's, it extremely suspenseful and i'm like yes. i can't wait to and read that's that set in princeton oh okay that. so i have to get my hands on that book um <laughs> you know you know make sure you tell me how to get off air how i can get my hands on it so i can okay. like share it on my social media in the holiday season i will um, and the announcement should be coming through very shortly i'm waiting for the proof to, uh, sunday i think the final oh, good oh, paperback good. proof from amazon who are delinquent oh, as usual so <laughs> Like, is the easiest way for everyone to get their hands on your writing if they just search Laurie A. Egan on Amazon? That's right. 
Okay. Um, I also sell some um, signed copies directly. So if you go to okay. my website, also lauriaegan.com, then um, you can contact me that way too. Okay. So we have the links to both your Amazon books and your website in the right. podcast show notes. So everyone go to the show notes, click those links for Laurie. <laughs> Also, um, I'm assuming on your website, they can find out how to con- like contact you, connect with you, all those. Yeah, there's a contact uh, link right there on the first page. Great. Okay. Well, Laurie, this has been wonderful. And now I'm like, so uh, artistically, uh, <laughs> you know, satisfied and artistically eager. Like I need to now, you know, practice what you're preaching to all of us. Uh, yes. Get busy. <laughs> Get busy. Exactly. Well, thank you, Laurie. This has been such a good conversation. A pleasure. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Very, very nice. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, bye, everyone.